Hello and welcome to RF Design Tutorials. This is part 2 of the 3 video series on demystifying SMA to RF board assembly and analysis. In this video, we will discuss different kind of transitions with the objective of designing and optimizing the SMA transitions. And we will take a look at various examples and it will give you plenty of tips and tricks which might be useful when you you know, proceed to design such transitions for your own application. Now, before you continue with this video, I would recommend you to watch part one of the video where we covered all the fundamentals required to import the 3D connector models or create your own 3D model of the SMA connector and then bring those models into ADS for RF simulation purpose. In the next video, we will talk about SMA and enclosure effect on your RF circuit performance. All right, so let's continue with this video and start discussing about how can you approach designing and then if required, optimizing the transition behavior to achieve a pretty good high frequency performance. Now to illustrate some of these topics, I have this example workspace, which will be available on Keysight Knowledge Center shortly. And I will post the link below this video. So feel free to go ahead and download this workspace if you have a Knowledge Center account. And then you can also start playing with all some of the designs which I am including here for your own purpose. All right, to start with, as we talked about in the last video, I have a couple of uh, SMA connector models from Signal Microwave. One is the edge mount connector, another is the top mount connector. And I also have another, you know, EM Pro connector, which is from other vendor, which I will use in one of the designs. All right, so you already know how to bring in those 3D CAD models into ADS. Now let's take a look at the first example where I have two layout views. One, which is the initial layout. And I will talk about, uh, you know, the basic fundamentals that people use to approach such designs. Then I have an RF Pro view, which is basically going to simulate that layout. And then based on the performance we obtained in the initial layout, we will talk about how to optimize that layout for much better performance. And then I also have an RF Pro view to do so. If you want, you can create different, different layout cells to do this activity. In my case, I have just simply done it in a single cell. It really doesn't matter. All right, so now let's take a layout, uh, the view at the layout, which I designed here. Here you can see a transmission line, which is like a micro strip. You have a ground plane at the bottom there, and then you have some grounding uh, for SMA uh, connector so that you can, um, you know, tie the micro strip ground to the SMA ground and these are the via holes uh, which are basically connecting the top conductor and the bottom conductor and here is the layout uh, you know uh, kind of 2D cross section view for our uh, SMA connector and in this case it's a H mount SMA connector. Now before we proceed let's go ahead and look at this stack up which I'm going to use so here you can notice I have a four layer uh, stack up in which I'm primarily going to work on the con layer, which is my main signal layer, and then M2, which is act, going to act as my ground layer, and then the VIA layer between these two conductor is with the name con underscore M2. It's a 20 mil uh, thick Rogers 4350 substrate with dielectric constant of 3.66. So that's the stack up. Now, once you have the stack up, first thing we need to do is calculate 50 ohm line width, which can be very easily done by either using your own line calculator or simply going to CILD, your controlled impedance line designer, which you can invoke using this icon. And here you can see the configurations micro strip, signal layer is gone, and then bottom plane is M2. As I covered in some of the earlier videos, there are various type of lines you could synthesize or you could calculate parameters for in CILD. So right now I'm only using micro strip single ended. Now based on the stack up, based on whatever your initial calculation, for example, 10 mil, you can enter that. You can enter your calculation frequency. So I'm entering one gigahertz and we can go ahead and analyze this line. And here we can notice this actually 96 ohm with that width. Now I need to quickly find 50 ohm, uh, you know, um, width basically. So we can quickly go to optimize. Here you can see 
the goal is characteristic impedance to be 50 ohm and here i can click on optimize button in front of width and now it shows me that 42 mil uh, width wide line will give me 50 ohm with this configuration of the startup so pretty cool right so we know 42 mil now using this calculation uh, if you notice this transmission line it has a height of 42 mil and exactly this is how i designed this line so it's pretty simple micro step line so now let's go ahead and open rf pro and i will use initial rf pro view because that's the uh, correct rf pro setup for this initial layout and that's how i provided the name for the nomenclature of the view so here now you can see pretty decent assembly you have a 50 ohm line you can see sma connector mounted on that line and the ground lug is connected uh, to the top level conductor and then you can see the via hole which is basically connecting the bottom ground of the micro strip to the top uh, layer uh, ground now i have already performed the simulation of this assembly because i wanted to save some time in the video to focus on more of the core techniques it takes about five minutes to run on my simple laptop now let's go ahead and look at this parameter response and here let's plot s11 and notice s11 is better than minus 20 db till about you know six seven gigahertz but after that performance become a little erratic and beyond you know a certain 17 gigahertz or so it really goes pretty bad so this is pretty awkward looking response for a micro strip line right similarly if you look at s21 you will again see the similar behavior it's kind of low pass filter response where we see a kind of resonant peak of around minus 4.5 db so not very bad but definitely not a good transition design especially if you are looking to do a very wide frequency or if you are going to work around you know this area or this zone of the frequency so why this is happening how can we improve the performance let's talk about it now whenever you deal with such you know kind of transitions notice that you have a pretty wide transmission line and now when you launch the energy um, from SMA connector to the micro strip line you obviously need to take care of two things one you need to minimize the impedance mismatch uh, between the SMA connector and transmission line but then you might argue well SMA connector is 50 ohm my transmission line is 50 ohm so where is the discontinuity well discontinuity develops from the fact that when your fields are inside uh, a connector basically those are tm mode propagation when you're launching it to micro step you have to do a soft handoff so that energy uh, can translate very smoothly from sma connector over to your printed line and in this case is a micro step line but uh, since there is a discontinuity between the ground or there is a problem with the ground distance on how the return current have to you know follow at the transition can make a whole lot of difference and that's precisely what you are seeing uh, in the s11 and s21 response so we need to optimize this transition now what are the good ways of optimizing transition well that's what we will talk about in optimized layout and here in optimized layout you can see at the launch point i simply created a nice cpw section which will ensure a smooth energy transfer from your sma connector over to the pcb or the microstrip structure so this is a small section here which is in this case is like a 50 mil long uh, transmission line when you can see i have designed the cpw transition and then after that it becomes a micro strip line all the way through so how can we approach cpw how can i do calculation of the cpw well again here let's open the stack app editor we can go to cild and instead of micro strip let's talk about cpw single ender and in here the same configuration of corn layer as my top the bottom plane is m2 and here i can fix my clearance which is let's say for example in this case i selected 10 mil no special reason but i thought 10 mil is just good enough to maintain a good distance between signal and ground and then let's enter the same um, width which we calculated for micro step which is 42 mil and if we end up designing this kind of um, 
you know, CPW structure, you can see the impedance of the line is around 43 ohm, which is not good. I need uh, 50 ohms. So how do I achieve 50 ohm in CPW? Well, again, like previously, we go to optimize and I will keep the clearance fixed as 10 mil. But here I'll click the optimize button in front of width so that we change the width to find uh, the width required for a 50 ohm CPW. And here quickly you can see and have a 50 ohm impedance with a width of around 31 or 32 mil, and which is pretty good enough. And exactly this is what I have used in my uh, layout design here. If I right click and measure, you will notice the width of this transmission line is 32 mil. And then the separation between this transmission line to this ground is 10 mil. So with this smooth CPW section, your performance should be much better. And we will see that in a moment. Now, again, there is another additional consideration when you design the CPWs. And if you have uh, dealt with CPW or grounded CPWs before, you know, uh, the VIA diameter and the VIA, you know, distance between each of these grounding VIAs may also play an important role to achieve desired optimum CPW performance for high frequency. And higher the frequency, more, uh, you know, attention you need to pay into some of these attributes. And again, we will talk about how can we optimize all this later in this video. All right, with this basic calculation, let's go ahead and open Optimized RF Pro because we are dealing with optimized layout here. And now with this RF Pro, again, in this RF Pro session, I have already performed the simulation all the way up to 40 gigahertz. And here you can see uh, the new design with CPW section and SMA lead uh, transferring the energy over in the CPW section and that energy gets transferred to a regular microstrip line. Now, if you look at the S parameter response here for this new improved design, and now, of course, you can see all the way up to 40 gigahertz, you have written loss better than minus 15 almost, and better than minus 20 dB written loss right up to, you know, 33, 34 gigahertz, which is much, much better than what we used to have earlier. And again, similarly, if you see S21, you will again notice a very nice linearly decaying performance of S21 with respect to frequency up to around 27 gigahertz. And after that, you can still see the drop, but this drop is not as bad as earlier. It is only minus 1.8. So it's much better than what we had. But then again, there is still a performance drop. And now you must be thinking that we have done uh, what was recommended, then why I'm still seeing this kind of performance. Now, not everything is could be due to the SMA to uh, transmission line transition. You also need to go back to the you know uh, fundamental of microstrip design. In this case, as you might have noticed, we are using a 12 mil thick substrate, which is anyway not recommended for anything more than 20 gigahertz or that kind of design. So beyond that performance, you will have um, you know the electric field, um, you know, retention issue. That means you will have radiation coming out of the board and the performance of such thick dielectric is not recommended for very high frequency. Actually, you should opt for thinner dielectrics uh, depending on the frequency range you're going to work with. And that's why uh, higher the frequency, thinner typically is the dielectric height which you need to deal with. Anyway, so if you put in a little more effort and if you, you are stuck with this 20 mil thick dielectric, you can still try out and optimize this design a little further. But anyway, I would not recommend using uh, more than, you know, a 10 mil, you know, kind of height if you are looking to do designs over 25 to 30 gigahertz. So in fact, even slightly thinner than 10 mil of the dielectric. But anyway, I think you got an idea. You got some tips on how to characterize such transitions. And now you have a pretty good, nice uh, transparent interconnect and flow or transfer of energy from SMA over to your board. Now you can take this transmission line and then associate it with uh, the RF circuit, which you might be designing, such as filter, amplifier, and so on and so forth. All right, so that was example number one. Now let's talk about example number two, where uh, in this particular case, I used uh, H-mount, but in certain kind of board designs, you may not 
have the opportunity to use edge mount because the traces which you're trying to simulate is actually in the uh, somewhere inside in the board and you need to make connections to those uh, you know circuits and in this case we end up using a top mount sma connector and here is a simple example of a top mount sma connector where you have the microstrip line you can see and then a top mount connector with certain via transitions so let me show that in rf pro because when you look at it in 3d view you can understand it slightly better now here in this assembly uh, you can see i have uh, a top mount sma and here the center lead of the sma is basically going and getting attached to the transmission line at the top which is basically currently is in corn layer and then you have kind of cpw section as we you know talked about previously and at the cpw section you can see the vias uh, the grounding via which is basically shorting the top conductor to the bottom ground plane of the micro strip or the cpwg kind of structure and again you can see a kind of semicircular ring of the vias which are kind of providing a coaxial you know transition over to cpw and then from that point onwards you have a regular cpw uh, kind of clearance now this kind of setup is very simple to do but then what happens when you look at the initial performance and here i have already again performed the simulation and let's look at the result of this transition which i did with some initial calculation and here you can see uh, this one one performance is not so nice because the return loss is poorer than minus 50 db uh, pretty quickly so if i am dealing with this kind of frequency range between around you know 10 to 20 or 25 gigahertz then this transition cannot be considered as a pretty good transition so obviously we have a scope for improvement similarly if you look at s21 and again you can see a little higher insertion loss of more than 0.4 dp it's actually around 0.45 dp so this is little more than what i would have expected from such a small transition so in these cases how do we approach uh, to improve the transition performance apart from doing some of the basic calculations so let me orient it in a bottom c direction now this kind of transition again can be improved by playing with the cpw transition area as well as the maintaining the distance of these grounding vias from this edge or the ground edge and also playing with via diameter so these are the three main uh, you know things which will control the performance of the cpw and basically we can do some sort of impedance matching from uh, the coaxial line over to the transmission line right so now the question is how do i make it parametric one is one uh, you know straightforward method is you go back to the layout make all those changes manually and then come back to rf pro simulate it again and then you can keep going back and forth back and forth till you get the best possible performance the another way is we can make this whole transition to be parametric whereby i can change the uh, the clearance of the cpw uh, you know uh, ground i can change the diameter of these vias i can play with the distance of these via holes from the edge and so on and so forth so based on that parameterization uh, as you might already know rf pro can run parametric em analysis very very easily so then we can utilize the power of rf pro to run parametric em and then achieve uh, the best possible performance so how do we do that so let's close this rf pro let's go back um, to this layout and try to understand now notice i have this section here which is basically the cpw launch and after that launch you can see again you have a micro strip kind of line and if i double click on that block you can see i have some parameter attached to that block which will allow me to change ground clearance you know uh, the ground uh, clearance at the curve portion i have the ground via distance i have the ground via radius so a lot of these um, you know things uh, can be controlled um, by user and i can play with those values to optimize the performance now the question is how did i create this parametric subnetwork which uh, where i can play with all these ground clearances and all that so here in this folder uh, 
if I go to my optimized design. So let me close uh, this uh, layout here. And here you can see I have a cell where I mention it as CPW launch and it's parametric. And here, this is a simple layout. I have not included a transmission line here. It's just the CPW ground structure along with those shorting vias and all that. The transmission line gets placed into the master layout wherever I place this guy as a sub-circuit. All right, so now in this case here, you can notice I have used a couple of layers. Number one, there is a solid rectangle, which I have drawn, which is basically denoting the overall ground plane where the connector body will be shorted. And in this case, this has some width and height associated. And this is designed on, or this is laid out on contour layer. Okay, you can choose any layer you want. And then this clearance, this uh, rectangle and this circle basically are designed on racy layer or drawn on racy layer. And then these via holes are basically same, uh, you know, using the whole layer. So let's go ahead and look at the stack up here. So the main corn layer is where I'm going to draw my microstrip or the CPW signal line. And then I have a whole layer, which is basically the via. And then on the bottom side, I'm simply using an ideal cover. But in case you have four layer, six layer, eight layer stack up, doesn't matter. This could be M2 layer, which you are going to use as a ground. For simplicity here, I'm simply using a micro step substrate with Rogers 4003, 8 mil height. And here I'm using an ideal cover plate or PEC, as you might uh, know it better. All right, so now with this um, structure, I have this. Now, then the question is, how do I make it parametrics? Because here you can see I have a rectangle and then the height of the rectangle is 0.8. That means the width of this rectangle. And then the diameter of the circle also is 0.4. That means diameter will be 0.8. So it is going to exactly align with this. Now, if you focus on the outline, uh, of the section here reaching and then going to the semicircle and coming out that's basically your cpw crown clearance now to achieve the clearance what you need to simply do you have to perform a boolean operation or just take a difference between con2 minus racy so once you do that you have this area cleared out as uh, so that you can lay um, you know print your transmission line or create your transmission line uh, between this uh, groove here right now how do i achieve all that that's number one number two how do i make it parametric so let's talk about it so let me go ahead and take this let's say control c let's open a new um, you know layout let's call it temp for the moment and let's copy uh, this section here and again what i'm going to do basically this center i'm going to move the center of this circle to the origin point because a lot of my calculation will become very easy if I do that. So here let's, or I can even go to insert, coordinate entry once it is already in a move mode, I can enter X and Y as zero, zero. And now you can see center is nicely aligned to zero, zero. All right, so now once you have this structure, I need to parameterize these objects. I can easily do so in ADS. And actually I have um, uh, one or two other videos on my YouTube channel, which talks about how to do parametrization in ADS. But let me, for the sake of this video, let me cover that here. Now, the way I, I parametrize any object in ADS is by simply going to EM, component, and parameter. This is where I declare the variable, right? And in this variable, basically, you have two methods. You can use nominal per tab method. That means when you're dealing with any arbitrary uh, drawing of polygons like rectangle, circle, etc., which you have drawn in ADS layout, you can use nominal per tab method. If you're parametrizing anything like transmission line, like micro strip line, and so on, remember those transmission lines already have width, length kind of attributes already attached. That means it itself is a parametric uh, subnetwork. So in, in case of you using those components, you can use subnetwork method. So in this case, let me go ahead with nominal per tab method. Now, let's say I will uh, declare a parameter called clearance. Now, I need to now decide where is this parameter going to attach. So essentially what I'm trying to do out of any arbitrary polygon, I'm trying to create a P cell or a parametric cell, basically. Right? 
So let's say this clearance is supposed to be attached to this, uh, you know, um, clearance or this rectangle. And also later I will attach it to this circle. But let's start with this, um, you know, rectangle. And here the things which are going to help you quite a bit is actually this info window and property window. If you don't see these two windows in your ADS layout, you, you can simply right click anywhere in the toolbar and from there you can enable info and properties. So once you have that, you can read all these attributes very quickly. You can look at the, you know, which layer it is drawn, where is the origin, what's the height, what's the area and so on. Some of this information will be helpful for you when you deal with this parameterization. All right, so I choose nominal and put up. So let's say I would like to play with the width of this rectangle and I need to enter a nominal value. Nominal value is something which you have already drawn an object with, right? So in case of this rectangle, if you see the height is 0.8, which is basically the, uh, the, the dimension in the Y axis. So I would like to play with this uh, dimension. So I entered that nominal value, which I have already used to draw. Now it is asking for per tap value. Now per tap value can be anything which is not equal to nominal value. It doesn't matter if it is more than 0.8 or less than 0.8 and so on. So in this case, I will go ahead and specify it as one. That means once I modify my geometry, my finished dimension will be equal to the per tap value. So with these two basic considerations, let's add this parameter. And once you click on add, now a copy of that layout will be open. And now it is asking you to define where this parameter will make a difference. And that is all about um, nominal per tab method. So you, you entered the nominal or you already had the nominal layout. You read that parameter value. You defined it as a nominal value of the variable. Now you need to show ADS how this object will change because remember you said per tab value to be one. So now ADS would like to know where is that one, how the value or the parameter will modify your geometry. And that's what per tab design is all about. And here you can choose variety of types like linear, stretch, radial, stretch, rotation, and so on. So in this case, it's a rectangle. I would like to do linear change in either x or y direction so here remember x direction will play with the length of this rectangle and i'm not going to change the length because the parameter clearance i define is only going to change the width of this rectangle so i will simply say delta x zero that means nothing will change with respect to length when i change that parameter but the delta y will be changed now this delta y Remember our perturbed value we defined was one mm, the nominal value is 0.8 mm. So overall delta, which will change in y direction is 0.2 mm. Now you can apply the delta onto one side completely, or you can split it half and half. So what I would like to do whenever I change the clearance value, I want half of that action happens on this upper edge and half of that action happens on lower edge so that it is always symmetric to this y equal to zero origin line, right? So I'm going to define it as plus 0.1. And once I do that, I make a create a rectangle and I select these two edge points of this rectangle. That means I would like to shift this edge plus 0.1, which is half of the delta between nominal value and part of value. But when this edge moves, think about it in CPW, these circles will also have to be moved, right? Otherwise, circle can come within the clearance if you ch if you don't change it along with the with this edge, right? So instead of only selecting these two lines, the way I will drag rectangle is to cover those circles along with these uh, you know points. So here, let's go ahead and try one more time. And if you don't um, seem to be able to select um, the the circles along with the edge point, is simply because um, read here in the command quick help is V when you need to combine the vertex and object selection, which is disabled by default. So what it means simply click V on your keyboard. And now once you drag um, the rectangle, now you can see those two corner points are selected as well as these circles are selected. And once you have made the right selection, you simply click apply. And now what you notice just now, this edge moved. And here, if you notice, 
now this edge has moved out by 0.1 mm now similarly on the lower side i'm going to select these bottom cpw uh, circles select these two vertex point and delta y now will be minus one because i want it to go down right so minus one click apply and now you see this edge also moves along with those via holes now if you right click and measure ideally the width of this line should be equal to 1 mm which which should be exactly equal to the perturbed value which you declared in the variable as long as it maintained that means your assignment was correct now let's cancel that measurement and now i click ok it comes back to the original design it has added a parameter and it is adhering to this definition so now you have the right scaling information in ads so once you place this layout as a sub circuit in any other layout when you will change this parameter it knows how to change all right pretty simple right okay now this is all about linear polygon now same thing i would like to do even for this circle because i always want diameter of this circle to be equal to the width of this line because then only i can maintain a smooth shape of this clearance which is like semicircular, you know kind of shape right so how do we go about it how do we deal with the circular objects so here for example here i will say clearance underscore r and d right which is like roundingness or whatever uh, name you can come up with and again nominal value is pointed and the uh, you know the the method i'm choosing in obviously nominal part up so here uh, when you deal with circular objects so here you are going to play with radius or diameter of of this thing here right so we don't recommend to uh, for you to use a unit because it's not x and y basically you are going to change all 360 degrees so the scaling works best if you select the unit as none make it like a ratio what it is right now and what you want it to be in terms of ratio any circular objects radius diameter can be parameterized best using this manner now to keep our scale factor uh, you know uh, into an integer i'm going to define the perturbed value as 1.6 now don't think that whatever perturbed value you are specifying that's the maximum or the minimum value which you later can change no it is right now only for scaling this object and giving ads the scale by how much it changed so that it has the gradient inside to to do proper scaling based on the parameter value all right so point 8 1.6 because point 8 is the diameter here you can see the radius of the circle is 0.4 so whenever you try to create any parametric design in ads the easiest thing you could do is keep these objects which you're trying to parameterize to very simple numbers don't go as 0.325 mm radius and so on just just keep it either totally integer or first decimal digit your calculations will be simpler you would be able to parameterize now once you you have a parametric geometry you can move it with as precision as you want you later when you place it as sub circuit if you want that circle radius to be 0.3569 you would be able to do that and ads would be able to scale this parameter all right okay enough explanation let's go ahead and change here so let's add a new parameter which is basically going to control the radius uh, here so again a copy of the layout opens with a nominal condition and now you can see the type automatically gets selected as radial stretch because we haven't specified any unit now the first thing it is asking it understood that you are trying to parameterize a circular uh, object or circular or you know elliptical whatever it is now it is asking you to enter x and y so that it can find the origin point and that is why i placed this um, you know a design to be an origin because now this circle if you notice here the center is at 0 0 even if you have placed it elsewhere it's fine because once you select in the info window, you can find where is the center of that uh, block which you're trying to parameterize. That's why I always prefer to keep this info window and properties window open. All right, let's enter center as 0, 0. And now this factor is basically the scaling factor. So if you ref remember, last time I, I mean, just in the previous window, I mentioned nominal value is 0.8. 
perturbed value is 1.6. So basically factor of two. So we simply say factor of two, click apply, and now you can see the circle gets a scale. Now, if you click and select the circle, you can see the radius is 0.8 now, which is basically 1.6 uh, mm diameter, correct? So as simple as that, now you have the circle whose radius is parameterized pretty easily. Similarly, you can go ahead and keep, um, you know, applying the scaling to these circles, which is basically exactly the same. The only thing you need to take care of, since these circles are not at zero, zero origin, the circle is kept at somewhere else, but you can read the center 0 0.7, right? So you can keep doing all of that in one shot. You don't need to add four different or five different parameters for each of these. So let me show you quickly how. So let's say this is the ground via radius. So I will go ahead and add a new parameter. Let's say ground via underscore red. The nominal value, which is basically the current diameter, which is 0.2. So I'll go ahead and change it to 0.2 nominal value. You can either use radius as a reference or diameter. So if you are entering 0.1, then basically it's going to, you have to enter 0.1 here. Okay, so the perturbed value I would like to give, uh, I mean, right now, uh, you know, here, if you're calling it radius, let's call it radius with this you know, nominal value of 0.1. If you were calling it diameter, you can appropriately change it. And the perturbed value is 0 0.2, which is basically scale factor of two, right? So once you have that, you go ahead and click add. Now you can select this first circle, read this, you know, read, uh, the origin as 0 0.7. So here enters zero, the center is 0 0.7, the factor is two and hit apply. And now you can see the radius gets doubled. Now, while this window is open, you want the same action to happen to all of these vias, right? You can even include these vias if you want, right? So now select the second circle whose uh, center is minus 0.5 to plus 0.5. So center X becomes minus uh, 0.5 and the Y becomes 0.5 with a factor of two. You hit apply. Similarly, you can select that. Center is minus 0.7 in X, Y is zero, and you click apply. So this way you can keep on doing. You can see how simple it is to parameterize multiple objects. So, so right now I'm stopping only at three, but you can continue to do as much as you want. Click OK, and now you can see you have a third parameter. Similarly, you can go ahead and change the you know distance um, from the center point according to just now how I showed you. For example, ground via distance, if I select, and again, I'm going to work with the scale factor because everything I'm going to consider is with the uh, origin of zero, zero, all right? So this distance right now, if I right click and measure, this distance from uh, the origin point is 0.7. So I would say the nominal value is 0.7. The perturbed value is going to be 1.4 click add and now here let's go ahead and select whatever vias you are going to move away or bring closer with respect to this origin point right so i'm going to measure distance from this origin point so center is zero zero of course because that's your reference point and then factor is going to be two and with this if you go ahead and apply now you can see the, the via changes by that amount. So this is one way. Now in this way, what you are actually doing, you are also changing the diameter or radius of that circle with a single shot. So you are changing the distance between, um, you know, from the center point as well as you're playing with the radius. So farther you are going from the center point, more radius you are doing. So if you want that way, you can go ahead and simply click OK. So now you hit two birds with one stone. But let's say if you didn't want that to happen, then of course you can go to linear stretch and you can parameterize it using a linear logic by assigning a proper unit, like in this case, for example. So you have a nominal distance of 0.7. Now with a linear scale, you don't need to keep it double. You can keep it one. And in that case, for example, if I want to just show you an example, dist one, click add. So now what's happening? 
this object has to move uh, in a different direction. So 0 0.7, and I kept perturb value as one. So in this case, I would say on x axis, so where I want this VR to move, it, it is, it's not supposed to move in the x direction, right? It's only supposed to move in the y axis. So I'll keep delta x as zero, delta y is 0 0.3, because nominal value was 0 0.7 and now it's one. So where is point seven coming from is actually the center of that circle, right? Click apply and now this object will move. So while that object is moving, you can also select that object, press this as delta y is minus three, it will apply and now it will move in this direction. You can pick this via, it should move in x direction. So delta y will be zero and then delta x will be minus 0.3 so i'm going to define it as minus 0.3 apply so similarly you can select that guy and say okay this is going to move by uh, minus 0.2 and you know plus 0.2 in this case so that it moves somewhere here Oops, sorry not double zero all right and when you see say apply it's basically going to move there you can see nice radius and then you can pick this guy and say okay it is going to move minus 0.2 on the x-axis minus 0.2 on the y-axis and you hit apply so now you can see you have the scaling in a linear domain when you're happy click ok so now you would be able to control this parameter so hopefully i spent uh, quite a bit of time to explain this concept but now you get the point Okay, now you understood all about parameterization of any object. Let's turn our attention. Let's open that CPW launch parameter design again. And now while I have created all the objects, so here you can see this ground object was in the contour layer. Uh, the, uh, the clearance which we were trying to create is on racy layer. But then how the Boolean operation will be performed between these two layers so that you can create a groove and that groove become parametric. So parameterization is already done. Now we need to create the Boolean operation between these two layers. And the way it is done in ADS is using a pretty nice concept called derived layer. So let's go to options, technology, layer definition. And in the layer definition here, you can notice I have an option to add a derived layer. So let me go ahead and add a derived layer, let's say with the name temp. Now, this is the resultant layer, which will happen due to certain operation, which we can define. Now you can choose various Boolean operation like AND, OR, DEF, XOR, or you can do certain sizing operations like grow and shrink. So in my case, I would like to do a Boolean operation. That means I would want to create a difference between first layer and the second layer. So in my case, the first layer is CON2 because that is where I'm drawing the overall ground rectangle. And then the second layer where my groove is getting created, which is basically parametric in nature, is designed on ray C. So once we do that, it will add a new layer called temp and temp has this operation defined. That means while in layout, you will have objects on CON2 and RACI, but eventually when you launch this layout for EM analysis, you will see object as a resultant on temp layer. And so similarly here, I have created a CPW underscore GND line, which has a difference operation defined between CON2 and RACI. Now this layer, which will get created as a resultant of this Boolean operation is mapped in my stack up. So if you look at a stack up, I have a con layer in which I would like to design a transmission line. I have a hole which is basically going to short the top level ground to the bottom. And then at the same level, I have simply right clicked map another conductor layer and here I chose the conductor layer name as CPWGND. Remember, this is a derived layer which is doing the Boolean operation. And I kept the thickness as 35 micron, which is actually equal to the same thickness of this corn layer. Right? So two metal layers mapped at the same level. So what will happen when we launch RF Pro? For example, here let's open RF Pro. Let's create substrate one conformal, which basically has that mapping. And if you launch this design into RF Pro, let's see what do we achieve. Although we are not performing simulation, I'm only using RF Pro as a visualization. Now you don't see anything. The reason why, because
because if I go back to my stack of definition, you see we have a bounding area layer with the name bound, which is basically defining the dielectric size. So here, uh, using the bound layer I have, let's draw a rectangle just to give a finite size of dielectric to satisfy the criteria as per our stack up. Now, let's launch this design into RF Pro and now you would be able to see the groove which is nicely created. So you see this, um, you know, gray color definition and if I open the substrate, look at the conductor, you can see there is a layer called CPWGND and when you select that conductor, you can see this uh, resultant polygon is selected, which is basically giving you the Boolean result of uh, con2 and the AC. Pretty neat concept, right? Now, this derived layer concept is a very, very important and very useful concept when you deal with such designs in areas. It is used at a variety of applications, especially for people working on defected ground structures. Imagine what all you can do with this derived layer. For example, if you want to puncture holes and you want that hole puncturing to happen, uh, you know, in a derived layer concept, how flexible your overall solution can be because those holes or the grooves which you're creating in your ground plane can be parametric in nature because you are dealing with positive polygons such as rectangle circle and by changing those parameters your resultant ground uh, can have a defect which is basically parametric and then you can run those parametric analysis in rf process a pretty cool capability all right so hopefully now this concept is clear so let me go ahead and remove this so once you have all the parameters defined the geometry is parametric you have the right stack up definition where you have mapped the derived layer now we can focus on our actual transition and that is exactly what you can see here so when you double click you have the relevant parameters in my case i only created four parameters and then you have this transmission so now if we open up rf pro and now we can perform a parametric analysis since now the object is parametric so in rf pro i created parameters you can see i have a couple of parameters which i added and these parameters are then if you look at the design property of the cpw launch parametric cell here i have those uh, parametric uh, you know parameters which we just define in the layout and then i assign the parameter values to that so now in rf pro i can very really easily set up parametric em uh, hopefully you already know that by going to parameter sweep i declared um, you know two variables uh, going like this clearance going from 0.6 mm to 1.2 mm and also ground via radius is changing so overall 28 combinations i'm going to run so you can either run it sequentially if you choose local host but if you have design cloud set up in your LSF or external cloud environment, you can run all these simulations in parallel so that you can achieve a much faster response or, or when you can cover all these parameters very quickly. So here, if I enable all the value combination, look at S11 and suddenly you can see the performance right from around minus 10 dB all the way up to you know better than minus 25 or minus 20 db and you can put a marker to to read out various values but in this case i already know the combination which i would like to show so ground via radius of 0.2 mm and the ground clearance of 1.1 mm and suddenly let's switch on s21 as well and now you can see right from dc to 30 gigahertz you have written loss better than minus 20 db which is pretty good right much better than what we used to have before and then if you look at s21 you can see pretty nice linearly uh, you know decaying performance till 30 gigahertz and maximum insertion loss of around minus 0.26 db which is excellent by any standard definition all right so now you can see how flexible how easy it is to modify or optimize these transitions and best part is you're doing all that in ads which is your main circuit design platform so you can co-simulate co-optimize these transitions along with your actual RF circuit design whether it is passive circuit or active circuit all things are possible now very easily within ads without you having to go to any third party 3D electromagnetic tool.
All right, with that example, let's move on to the next example. And here we have a CPW example, which is again full blown CPW, like uh, we just talked about. Using CILD, you can calculate uh, the CPW uh, you know, parameters, like signal line width, ground clearance, and so on. And using that fundamental in this particular design, we use the top mount SMA connector, and you can see all the ground vias behind. And again, you can, if needed, you can parameterize these objects. And here you can see I use slightly different concept. And here I'm using a taper, starting with a slightly lesser than 50 ohm width, which is basically a little higher impedance, because these SMA leads often causes capacitance effect. So I'm trying to nullify that. And slowly with taper, the impedance transforms to 50 ohm. And then I've done some calculations of this CPW uh, via radius uh, or the ground via radius and the separation between them. Now with this, uh, if we look at the performance in here, uh, we didn't need to do any kind of parametric analysis, just basic calculation, putting a little bit careful consideration. And you can see right up to 40 gigahertz, you have excellent return loss performance from this transition. And also S21 is excellent till 40 gigahertz, giving you confidence that now you can use these kind of designs very, very easily and simulate them uh, very nicely with RF Pro. And again, this is a complete uh, SMA to CPW transition. Now let's look at another example, which is again uh, pretty similar to what we did. It's SMA to strip line transition. The only difference in strip line transition is unlike micro strip or CPW, the main conductor will be buried, um, you know, somewhere in between. And in this particular case, if we look at uh, the stack up here, you can see various metal uh, layers on different, uh, you know, dielectric layer. It's a six layer dielectric. This is my strip line layer. M4 is where my strip is going to be created. M3 and M5 are the two ground planes which will work. So to proceed with this design, I've basically only created a simple strip line, which is um, the dimension is calculated by CILD. And we simulate this strip line alone in RF Pro to make sure the performance is okay. And now if you look at S parameter response of this strip line, pretty well, uh, right up to you know 20 gigahertz, this kind of pretty decent uh, S11 and also S21 is pretty nice till 20 gigahertz. And now with this strip line, when it is designed, let's focus on the transition, how I'm going to transfer the energy from SMA connector to the strip line and then on the other side, take it back if needed. All right, so here using the same concept I just explained, I created this footprint of the SMA launch. And in this footprint, if you look at 3D view, you have the signal via, which is the center via, and then you have four grounding vias. And then I have a circle which is going to provide the ground clearance. And this circle is created on silk screen top. Now, since it is a six layer stack up, and let me open RF Pro first so that you get a uh, you know full idea. So here in RF Pro, you can see you have uh, you know ground layers or the ground conductor are drawn on different layers, and then you have a strip line coming out at M4, and then you have this kind of groove or clearance created which is basically going to provide you certain capacitance. And then you can control the capacitance by controlling the, the diameter of this clearance and also playing with a little bit of the, the grounding via distance and also the diameter of those vias or radius of those vias. All right, so how do we achieve all that? Well, again, it's the same derived layer concept, which I explained. So if I open up this stack up here, uh, notice I have few custom layers like con D, M2D, M3D. What are these layers? Basically simple, uh, sorry, non-material definition. Let's go to layer definition. And again, in this um, you know layer property here, you can see I have con D, M2D, M3D, which basically is doing Boolean operation between con and silk screen top. M2 and silly screen top and so on. So they are basically Boolean resultant of these operations. So if you look at the actual uh, launch layout, 
here I have solid rectangles drawn on corn layer, corn two layer, M two layer, M five layer, M four layer, and so on and so forth. Right. So then how it appears in RF Pro is basically the Boolean resultant. And in this case, again, since this is parametric, I can go ahead and create some parameters or variables in RF Pro. And then here you can see a uh, couple of these um, parameters are assigned with a variable. And this variable is then getting swept in RF Pro. Here I'm sweeping the ground clearance value from 25 mil to 50 mil in a step of 5 mil. Again, when you get access to this workspace, uh, take note of different units and different designs because I have different libraries which are uh, using different kind of units just to show you variety. All right, so once we have performed all the simulation, let's look at its parameter result. This was our nominal result. That's where we started and you can see the performance is not so good because you cross the 20, minus 20 dB threshold right at three gigahertz around itself and then it goes on. But with the help of this parametric analysis, you can see the overall spread. And again, if you don't want to switch on all of them, you can switch it on one by one. So like for example, at 30 mil clearance, you can extend minus 20 dB data loss till like 12 gigahertz and then you can play with other values and again this is a simple example if you want you can go and uh, go ahead and optimize it even all the way up to 20 gigahertz so that you achieve return loss better than minus 20 db all the way through but i leave that exercise to you all right so with this simple explanation now i have shown you various examples we talked about various tips and tricks we talked about how to parameterize uh, some of these objects very easily in ADS, how to use derived layer concept very effectively to do your job. So hopefully all the tip and tricks which I have offered will be helpful for your actual design work. So that's all in this video. Now, uh, the next video which will come up will be on SMA and enclosure effect on RF circuit performance to account for all the mechanical uh, you know, issues which might uh, adversely affect your RF circuit performance and how to avoid it, how to simulate some of those uh, when you're doing active or passive circuit design in ADS. And then you can perform a full integrated assembly level simulation in RF Pro. So thanks a lot for this um, attention which you have provided me in this video and staying till the end of this video. It was a pleasure, um, you know, presenting some of these topics and tips and tricks to you. Wish you all the best in your design work.